welcome you back again to another Sunday School lesson. This morning we're looking at Revelation chapter 8 and chapter 9, the seventh seal and the trumpet judgments. And rather lengthy lesson to get through, so we'll not be able to get too deep into this to try to hit the high spots, but before we go start the end of the lesson, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, just want to thank you for another wonderful, beautiful day that you've blessed us with. Thank you most of all for Jesus who died on the cross to shed his precious blood that we could be saved. Thank you for the things we learn here in your word and the book of Revelation and how you reveal yourself unto us and the judgments and the things that are going to take place in the future. Lord, pray that we just have a good, as we go through and study, that we could get a great, greater and deeper understanding of the truths of your word and pray that just this would be a blessing to those that watch this video and could get some help and instruction from it. And just help me to say the words you'd have me to say. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So we're picking up in Revelation chapter 8. And again, the title of Lessons of Seventh Seal and the Trumpet Judgments. And if you remember in chapter 6, we left off with the sixth seal being opened and leaving the seventh seal to be opened. And so that's where we pick up in this chapter 8. Remember last week in chapter 7 was a parenthetical. Uh, we saw a couple of events that took place that do not go into the normal chronological sequence of events. So it says, And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. So think about this. As we've seen back in chapter 4 and 5 and even in chapter 7, we saw you know, angels and, and tribulation saints and the four and twenty elders and the four beasts all praising God and glorifying God. It was not quiet. It was not silent in heaven. But yet, when this seventh seal is opened, there's silence for a half hour. Why? Because they realize the impending judgment that's fixing to be poured out upon the earth and those that inhabit the earth with this opening of the seventh seal which has underneath it the seven trumpet judgments. And so for a half an hour, there's total silence. And can you imagine you know, heaven being totally silent for a half hour after we've seen all that praising and glorifying going on? It says in verse 2, it says, And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. So here John sees these seven angels. They are obviously a unique, unique group of angels because it says they stand before God. And they're given these seven trumpets to which they're going to blow. These trumpets are probably ram's horn type trumpets. And trumpets in the Bible were used to you know, call an assembly together, to call, a, call a, a group to battle, and various other things that trumpets were used for to, to, to sound a warning, etc. But it says here we see that those seven angels are given these seven trumpets. It says in verse number 3, And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the whole golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came in with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. So here we see that we, this other angel comes forth and... We see he has a censer, and he goes to the. It's a golden censer. It's made of, you know, it's at least at least by Mary Rhythm plated in gold, uh, if not totally made of gold. And he was given much incense, and he offered that incense along with the prayers of all saints. So I think this is the prayers of all saints through all eternity. And what would a prayer would that possibly be? That would be the. It would be offered at this point, possibly as we see in the model prayer, the pray instruction to pray, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done. You know, it's every, a true Christian, a true saint of God should be desiring to see God's kingdom come to fruition and to see that the Lord Jesus Christ reign upon the throne there in Jerusalem. And so they're given much incense and, these, and the, he offers this upon the golden altar which is before the throne. So this golden altar is akin to the the altar that we see before the Holy of Holies. It was a golden altar, the altar of incense. 
And again, here we see it's before the throne of God. And similarly, as it's positioned there outside of the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle in the temple, inside the Holy of Holies was the Ark of the Covenant. Up on the top of the Ark of the Covenant was the, the two cherubims. And between the cherubims was what we call the mercy seat. And the mercy seat was where God would come down and be in the midst of his people there. And so, again, kind of like a throne there. So there's where God's presence is. And so right before it is this altar. And so that incense goes up before God and before his throne. And we see that it ascends up before God out of the angel's hand. And, then, and so a lot of commentators believe that this angel is the Lord Jesus Christ because this angel is doing high priestly act here in offering this incense and offering these prayers up in this censer. And so it would make sense that Jesus being our high priest would be the one who would be performing this act here of offering up these prayers. And it says that the angel, verse 5 talks about how the angel took the censer and then he filled it with fire. So there's no incense here, there's no prayers here. He just puts fire from the altar onto the, and this is the brazen altar, the altar of sacrifice, most likely, because that's the one where the sacrifices were burnt and there would be fire upon the altar. There could be, but he takes fire from the altar and he casts it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. So this censer is tossed down from heaven, down to the earth, and it causes voices to be heard and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake to happen on the earth, giving a warning of impending doom of what's fixing to happen as these seven trumpets begin to sound. And so that brings us here to the, the trumpets. And verse number six says, And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. So they get ready, they prepare themselves to sound each trumpet in order. And it says, And the first angel sounded, Verse 7, there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and there were cast upon the earth, and the third part of the trees were, was burnt up, and all green grass was burnt up. So the first angel sounds his trumpet, and hail and fire falls from heaven, and falls upon the earth, falls out of the sky, and it says it's mingled with blood. Now, was the blood falling from the sky also? It could have been, or it could just be that the result that the fire, the, the hailstones and the fire, once it hits the ground, was mingled with blood because it was hitting people and animals and causing them to bleed. And, you know, that could be the, and also a possibility here. But we see that it's, it's hail and fire mingled with blood and it's falling upon the earth. And we see that it basically destroys one-third of the trees on the entire earth and it destroys all the grass. So the grass is burnt up. The fire is what burns up the trees and it burns up the grass here. It totally destroys all grass. And we saw just back in with the seven seals being broken, we saw that the black horse rider came out and along with him came famine and destruction. And so here we got even a cause for even more reason for famine and, to, and people to be going hungry because now livestock doesn't even have anything to eat because the grass has been burned up, you know, a third of the trees being destroyed. Many of those could have been fruit trees and again, you know, more further, you know, complicating the matter and making the situation with the need for food even more dire. So verse 8 says, And the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast in the sea, and a third part of the sea became blood, and the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and the third part of the ships were destroyed. So we see here that this great mountain, John sees, falls into the sea. Now some commentators want to say this is like a volcanic eruption within the sea and we know there are volcanoes under the surface of this ocean. We just saw back under the sixth seal the great earthquake and how we talked about how that, that probably coincided with you know volcanic activity at that point in time with the sixth seal being open and how that, that probably the, these constant earthquakes and movements of the earth and stuff probably drastically changes the landscape of the earth during this time period and here. But we see this great mountain here. I'm of the personal opinion that this is an asteroid because it makes more sense based on the description that John gives it. You think of a huge chunk of rock, an asteroid coming into the Earth's atmosphere, it would start to burn up and fire would fly from it and it would, and if it crashed into the sea, then it would cause a great tidal wave which would easily destroy a third of the ships and would definitely have an impact on the sea life and it definitely 
could basically poison the waters in some way and make them to where the animal life would die and then just shear from the animal death of the animal life and the human life on the ships. You could end up with blood in the water and, it, and again here it says that the water became as it came, became blood. So we see that that water becomes red and, and like blood and, and quite nasty and, just, and, and, and probably had a stink to it just as we saw back when the waters were turned to blood in the Nile River back in the plagues upon Egypt. Then it says in verse number 10, it says, And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp. And it fell upon the third part of the waters, and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of this of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died from the waters, because they were made bitter. So here, when the third angel sounds, we see that, he, that a, we see a great star that falls from heaven. And... What this might be, we, you know, some suggest that it could be a comet that enters into the Earth's atmosphere or either hits the Earth one. Uh, the description here is adequate enough to believe that. If you think about what a comet is, it is a, is a cluster of frozen material that circles around the sun, and as it gets closer to the sun, then some of that material starts to vaporize off, and that's the reason you see the comet tail behind it. And when you, if you see one in the sky, in the night sky, and so if you think about a comet being a lot of frozen material, if it entered into the Earth's atmosphere and got superheated by the entry into the Earth's atmosphere, that a lot of that stuff would evaporate and then precipitate back onto the land and could very easily poison with heavy metals and other things a third part of the water, fresh water upon the Earth, and therefore make the waters bitter through the heavy elements and non-Earth elements that would be found inside of such a comet. And again, you know, the name wormwood here is actually get, is describing a plant that's actually used to make the alcoholic beverage abstinence. And that's, they say that's one of the most intoxicating beverages there are. But it says here that many men died because of drinking of these bitter waters. And so we think about heavy metal pollution of waters will definitely cause people to die. So we've seen, you know, many people died as a result probably died as a result of the fire and the hell falling on them. Now we have, you know, many people died because a third part of the ships were destroyed by the great mountain or asteroid that fell and came into the sea. And then we see here that people died from drinking these bitter waters that are poisoned from the result of this star, most likely a comet that entered into the Earth's atmosphere and precipitated out heavy metals into the, into the water supply. And so we're seeing a whole lot of death throughout this period. And then verse number 12 says, And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and a third part of the moon, and a third part of the stars, so the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for the third part of it, and the night likewise. So here we see in the fourth one, angel sounds his trumpet, and the sun is partially darkened, the moon is partially darkened, the stars are partially darkened. We talked about back with the sixth seal being opened, how that, you know, the earthquake and the volcanic activity would have put a lot of ash and debris into the atmosphere and would have caused the sun to be darkened and caused the moon to appear as blood. But now we've got this asteroid that's hit the earth which would have thrown a lot of debris up into this into the atmosphere. Again this comet entering into the earth's atmosphere and putting a lot of more debris into the atmosphere would have created a situation where the where the sky would be even more filled with debris and, and dust and, and stuff and that would again cause the earth the sun and the moon and the stars to be darkened and not to shine as brightly and so there would be greater darkness throughout the day as a result of that and then we come in on to verse 13 it says and I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven saying with a loud voice woe 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 to the inhabitants of the earth by reasoning of the other voices of the trumpets of the three angels which are yet to sound so here John hears and he sees this angel flying through the skies here and he's proclaiming a woe 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 to the inhabitants of the earth now this inhabitants of the earth speaks of those who put their trust and existence in their earthly lives they're all about what they can consume, what they can do during their life here on earth. It has, it, they're, they're not interested in the afterlife. They're not interested in anything hereafter. They're just interested in you know, what's going on on earth. They're, they're, they're satisfied with the life that they have on earth. And so they have no desire to seek God. They have no desire to look for a, for a Savior. 
they're, they're just satisfied and, and they're inhabitants of the earth. They're, the earth is their home. They are, they're, you could liken these to people who are so concerned about trying to save the earth from destruction and from, you know, for mankind. And those are so concerned about, you know, you know, you know that don't even believe in a God. Eight people of, 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 that are atheists. They're just, they're, they're trusting in what they can do in just this life and they're, they don't think there's anything hereafter. And so he says, you know, these next three trumpets, they're going to be severe. He's given, declaring them woes. So you see that these last three trumpets are also the three woes. And so as we go into chapter 9, we're going to start looking at these, the next two trumpets, which are the first two woes. And the chapter 9 goes into great detail about these two. So in chapter 9, it says, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as a smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but, also those, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, that they, they should be tormented five months, and their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh the man. So here this fifth angel sounds, and we see a star fall from heaven, and this star is described as a he. There's a lot of varying opinions on this. Some think that this star falling from heaven is the Lord Jesus Christ. Others think that it's Satan. I am of the latter opinion. I do not believe that Jesus Christ would fall from heaven. Only Satan could fall from heaven. I believe, in my opinion, at this point, Satan is cast out of heaven for good. Right now, Satan is able to go into heaven, as we see in the book of Job, and to be an accuser of the brethren. He's able to accuse, you know, he went there and said, you know, Job will will deny you God, and he'll, he'll curse you God if you allow me to touch him and to you know, have an impact upon his life. And we see that, you know, that he's, he, can, he has access to heaven now. But I believe at this point he's cast out of heaven entirely and for good. And again, and it says he's given the key to the bottomless pit. You know, some of those who think this is Christ, they go over to the fact that over in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 18, it says, Christ said there that I have the keys to death and hell. If Jesus has the keys, he wouldn't need to be given the key to hell here. This is what the bottomless pit is. It is hell. He would not need to be given this key if, G, if this was Jesus. So, again, that's the reason I believe it is Satan here that falls from heaven and is given this key to open, this, open the bottomless pit or hell here. And we see that their great smoke comes out of hell and... We know that hell is a place of fire, it's a place of weeping, it's a gnashing of teeth, it's a place of torments, it's a place that was prepared for the devil and his angels. But we see here that it's opened up and it's like the smoke of a great furnace and the smoke comes out of this pit and out of the smoke comes these locusts. And these, you know, you think of, and it says here that these locusts in verse 3 have the power of scorpions. So they're not normal locusts. And as we go on through here, we'll see the description of these locusts and they're definitely not normal locusts. But we go on in verse 4 and they're commanded that they're not to hurt vegetation. Locusts consume vegetation. They consume crops. And that's the reason a lot of famine and stuff occurs. Go back over to the book of Joel and you can read a great detailed uh, explanation you know, thing about where God sends lo a judgment of locusts upon the nation of Israel in the early chapters of the book of Joel. And you can read there about that, you know, and how destructive they are. They're very destructive creatures. They can wipe the, you know, uh, totally wipe all vegetation off the face of the area that they walk through. But here they're told not to hurt the vegetation. Now, interestingly here, it says that they're not to hurt the grass. So we saw back in the first trumpet that the grass was burned up. So obviously there's enough time between the first trumpet and this fifth trumpet that transpires that allows the grass to grow back so that there is grass that these locusts could hurt, but they're, to, they're told not to hurt grass, but yet they're to hurt only the, the people on earth who do not have the seal of God. Now remember last week we studied about the 144,000 Jews who were sealed of God there. 
And so that's the reason we had this parenthetical chapter in verse chapter number 7 in order to inform us about these 144,000 sealed Jews. And so that we understand why these, who these sealed people are that are not allowed to be harmed by these, these locusts. But it says here that it says that, that in verse 5 says that they can't, they're not to kill the people they torment. But they're the torment them just like the sting of a scorpion. Now, I've never even seen a scorpion in the wild and have no idea what a scorpion sting would feel like, but it, it's probably a very excruciating thing and a very painful thing from what I understand. But it says here that they're, they're torment men for five months. And it says that they shouldn't, they shouldn't kill them. Now in verse 6 it goes on, it says, And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. So they're going to be, men are going to be stung by these locust creatures that have stings like that of a a scorpion, and it's they're going to be tormented by these these locusts, but yet they're not going to be able to die. And you see so much today on TV and in movies about zombies. Well, guess what? In this time period, under this fifth seal, the zombies will be real. People will be walking around with all kinds of, I believe, all kinds of injuries and will probably even try to kill themselves to escape the torment of these locusts but they won't be able to die. So people will be literally walking around. A person that should be dead will be walking around still alive. And so you're literally going to have zombie, what we would call a zombie walking around during this fifth seal. Now the next few verses here describe these locusts. We're not going to go into great detail of this. We're just going to read it and you can just see what it says for yourself. I'm not going to give a lot of commentary or in your explanation about it, but it says here, And the shapes of these locusts were like unto horses prepared into battle, and on their heads were, as it were, crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men, and they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth as the teeth of lions, and they had breastplates as were breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months." And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue his, hath his name Apollyon. Verse 12 says, And one woe is past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. So here we see these locust creatures. They're, they're very weird. They have men's faces and women's hair and lion's teeth and breastplates of iron, and their wings are very noisy, which if you got a huge amount of you know of anything of making a sound like they say the cicadas are supposed to be in having a cycle coming out in in this general area this year and that they'll be very loud you know if you've ever heard cicadas they can be deafeningly loud uh, so you can just imagine the sound of all these locust creatures flying about and how over how loud they are and says here they have a king over them one that's directing them and guarding them and this I believe here is Satan is the one leading them and, and guiding them here in their destruction that they go about here. So now we see in verse 12 that this first woe is passed and there's two more woes yet to come. So in verse number 13 we see the sixth angel and it says, And the sixth angel sounded and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar which is before God, saying to the sixth angel which hath the trumpet, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates, and the four angels were loose, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. So we see the sixth angel blows his trumpet here in verse number 13, and then there's a voice that John hears that issues out from this golden incense altar that is before God from the four horns, and the horns on an altar represent power. And so there's, there's power behind this command, and he says to loose the four angels that are bound in the river Euphrates. These are obviously fallen angels, wicked, evil angels that fell with the devil and his rebellion against God. But for some reason, these four particular angels, there's something unique about them. They have been bound in the river Euphrates. And it says here in verse number 15 that they were prepared for a day and a month and a year, or an hour and a day and a month and a year. And basically, they were prepared for a specific purpose, and their specific purpose that they were prepared for, which is 
to slay a third part of men upon the earth. So now we see that after a five-month period and being tormented by locusts, men now, and not being able to die, men are now going to be able to die because these four angels are going to lead this army that we're going to see here that to slay one-third of all men on the planet. And think about, that's a huge, we don't know how many men will, how many people will be still on the planet to this point, but if you think about the fact that there's seven point nine billion people or so on earth right now, you're, you're looking at, you know, billions of people are going to die as a result of these four angels being loosed from the river Euphrates. It says in verse 16, And the number of the army of the horsemen were two hundred thousand thousand, and I heard the number of them. And, I, and thus I saw the horses in the vision, and they that sat on them had been breastplates of fire, and of jacinth, and brimstone, and the heads of the horses were the heads of lions, and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. And by these three was a third part of men killed by the fire and by the smoke and by the brimstone which issued out of their mouths. For their powers in their mouth and in their tails, for their tails were like the serpents and had heads, and with them they do hurt. So here we see that there's this huge army that are following after these angels. It says that they are 200,000 thousand, which is 200 million. It's a huge army. At, I believe it said that at the height of World War II, the Allied armies only had around 70 million soldiers. So you're talking about 200 million soldiers here. And that's a huge number in this army. Now, whether these are demonic creatures, we don't know. Whether these are men, John is describing them here, and he describes that these that these horsemen that at there, and they, he really doesn't describe the horsemen that much. He says they have breastplates of fire and jacinth and brimstone. They you know they have you know obviously some you know very ornate, colorful looking armor upon them. But, and you know, so it looks like you know, they're, like there's fire and, and these these two stones and brimstone fire being fiery and brimstone. So you know, like they're like they have fiery so, so they could very well be demon type creatures here that are upon these horses. And these horses definitely are different. You know, and you know, some commentators want to say this is some kind of modern military equipment. Or something, but and, you know, one of the things I thought about, you know, there's a lot of experimenting and stuff, and you've even seen it in sci-fi kind of movies, probably, where they're kind of experimenting with these exoskeleton, mechanical exoskeleton things to try to, you know, assist soldiers in in battle and in in fighting wars to you know kind of protect them, but also give them more ability to to fight with bigger and and more powerful weapons and have individual controls over these kind of exoskeleton robotic type you know control where the a person would control them so it could be something like that we don't we don't know we don't really know where these where these these 200 million soldiers show up horsemen show up from we just know that they just show up here to, to go to, out and kill a third part of the men along with these four angels that are bound in the Euphrates but we see here that you know they they're going about to hit heal heal and they said they have like heads of serpents and they're on their tails and and again you know I could in my mind I could almost you know talk about here how they have heads of lions and out of their mouth issues fire and brimstone I could see that being some type of a you know John trying in his best to describe some type of modern weapon where you're you know like a tank or something trying to you know shoot shells out of the the turret on the gun on the torrent or something like that or even having you know like raised up missile banks on the back of it that would kind of look like a the head of a you know a king cobra sitting you know standing up on its you know to you know fixing to spit at you or something uh so i mean i could see how that that could could be a you know some kind of a military equipment but we don't know for certain we just we see this description john's trying his best to describe what he sees is the best to the best of his ability, but we see that they have the power to hurt through their mouths and through their tails here, and they, they you know, their job is to destroy one third of men on the planet. And but here's the interesting thing in verse 20 it says, And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, 
that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. So here we see that even in spite of all these six trumpets that have been blown, not to mention the six seals that were opened and the great amount of destruction that came as a part of those, men still refuse to acknowledge God for who He is and to repent and to seek Him for salvation. They still prefer to worship devils and idol gods made out of, out of precious metals and stone and wood that can't do anything. They're just, you know, you, you, a person, there's many passages of scripture throughout the Bible where it talks about, you know, men taking a piece of wood and carving, using some of it to, to burn up, to start a fire, to cook some food, and then taking the rest of the wood and then carving it into an idol that they bow down and worship. I mean, what nonsense is. You have to take and pick up those idols and carry them around. They can do nothing. They can't talk. They can't speak. They can't commune with you. But yet we can commune with our Heavenly Father and we can carry on conversations with Him through prayer and He can reveal His truths through His Holy Spirit and through the Word of God to us and we can have two-way communication with Him and He's a God that's real and it's true and He totally instructed the, in the Ten Commandments for the children of Israel not to set up any idol gods, but yet we see that these men during this time, even after all this destruction and death, the ones that are still alive refuse to repent of their wicked deeds. They refuse to repent of their murders. They refuse to repent of their sorceries. And this word sorcery is actually the word for where we get pharmacy or pharmaceuticals from, so it speaks more about of, of drugs and chemicals and stuff like that used to affect the body so it, it's more of that kind of thing rather than, than what we would normally think of sorcery and witchcraft but it can also carry that ideal too there but we see here in the, the fornication the sexual sins and also the thefts the robberies and, and stealing from one another but they refuse to repent of these things and it's just it it has to blow your mind to realize that people have went through all this great destruction and judgment that's being poured out through the six seals and now the seventh seal pouring out so far the seven, six of the seven trumpets underneath them and these last two that we've been looking at being the first two woes and we'll, we'll be able to pick up the seventh trumpet until over into chapter 11 but we see such great destruction and death and everything going on but yet the men will refuse to repent and to turn to God before it's everlasting too late. It's just it just shows you how hard-hearted they were. You think about Pharaoh when the, God was bringing the judgments and the, and the plagues upon Egypt there and trying to get Pharaoh to let the children of Israel go. Pharaoh continued to harden his heart and harden his heart and harden his heart and wouldn't let the people go. And even after he finally did let them go, his heart was so hardened he chased after them, desiring to, to capture them back and bring them back to the land. And I think that's the exact same thing that happens here through all these judgments and all this stuff that they obviously see the hand of God because they knew it was the hand of God when the sixth seal was opened because they got a glimpse into heaven as the scroll was, the heaven was rolled back as a scroll and they could see into, heaven, into the third heaven and see that God on his throne and see that the you know, approaching the fact that the Lamb was soon to come and to pour out his judgment upon the earth. But yet they called for the rocks and the mountains to fall on them that they wouldn't have to face the judgment of God but still refuse to repent. So here, even with all this extra destruction and death, they still refuse to repent of their sins. And that's the thing that we need to realize. We need to repent. We, you know, If you're lost and not saved, you need to repent. You need to seek the Lord and be saved. And if you're saved, we have to repent daily. We're not perfect creatures. We're constantly failing and coming short of the glory of God and we need to repent and to ask God to forgive us throughout the things that every each and every day for where and the ways we fail him. But I know it's kind of hurried and tried to get through this lesson in these two chapters in a not too long amount of time. I hope you've got a little blessing out of this and let's just pray for our service on Sunday as we meet back in the Lord's house to hear the word of the Lord preached. Once again, thank you for watching.